So, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. It is with great pleasure that I welcome you all here today for this webinar on multi-scale clinical optoacoustic skin imaging. I am Dr. Tim Devling, Director of Sales and Applications at iThera Medical, and I will be moderating this session. The webinar itself will last for about 40 minutes, and we really, really encourage questions. If you maximize the GoTo tool, you can see a question box where you can type them in and we will answer them at the end. The webinar will also be recorded and we'll send you a link in the next few days. So today I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Chris Ho and Dr. Dinesh US from the Laboratory of Bioptical Imaging at Singapore Bioimaging Consortium, the SBIC, from the Agency for Science, Technology and Research in Singapore. The SBIC is a multidisciplinary center of biologists, chemists, physicists, material scientists, biomedical scientists, and AI scientists, all with the aim to investigate human diseases. We've had the great pleasure of working with investigators from the SBIC over the years, and have even established a joint SBIC, SBIC Ithera Imaging Center to facilitate optoacoustic technology development and its clinical translation. Over this time, we've seen the transition from initial optoacoustic experimentation to actual bedside monitoring of patient therapy. And I will point out that indeed, the SBIC is open to and actively seeking collaboration from academia, clinicians and industry to further enhance the research relevant to human disease. The webinar today will be split into two portions. Chris will talk about MSOT, a macroscopic technique for imaging of skin cancer, while Dinesh will talk about his work with RSOM for microscopic analysis of skin inflammation. Coincidentally, this work was published this week in the Journal of the American Academy of Dermatology. So, thank you, and I'll say over to you, Chris, for a very enjoyable talk. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Tim, for, for the kind introduction. Uh, first of all, a very good welcome to everyone who is tuning into this webinar. Uh, this is Chris here. It's my great pleasure to present our work over the last few years, together with my colleague, Dr. Dinesh, on the use of optoacoustic imaging for the investigation of skin diseases. Without further ado, let's get started. Okay, so uh, here's a brief outline of what we'll be covering today. Right. So as Tim mentioned, we are covering uh, two main applications. In the first half, I'll talk about how we can use multispectral autoacoustic tomography, or MSOT in short, to provide 3D mapping of surgical margins in non-melanoma skin cancer. In the second half, Dr. Dinesh will discuss on how we can use a rusted scanning optoacoustic mesoscopy, or RSOM, to perform high resolution imaging of skin microvasculature and also derive some imaging matrix in patients with atopic dermatitis or commonly known as eczema. Um, to start off, here's a quick overview of the optoacoustic imaging principle. The word optoacoustic literally means light and sound or more specifically, light-induced ultrasound. So, how do we use light to generate ultrasound? Uh, tissue absorbs uh, light from the laser that is impinging on it, and that causes a thermoelastic expansion of tissue, uh, which in turn generates an ultrasound wave. The wave can then be detected by a conventional ultrasound transducer that converts the wave to electrical signal. So the signals can then be processed uh, using some signal imaging processing algorithm to form an image. So a typical optoacoustic setup uh, consists of two main components, uh, together with some minor ones. Essentially has a source, a laser source, which is a tunable nanosecond pulse laser, as well as the ultrasound detection system. Okay, so, uh, so before we go into study proper, uh, here's an overview of uh, some of the imaging modalities that is being used in the clinic uh, right now. So on one end, we have uh, something called reflectance confocal microscopy. Uh, we also have multi-photon and OCT. 
uh, of these modalities offer high cellular resolution, um, basically used for morphological imaging. Um, uh, there's some drawbacks in terms of penetration depth uh, limitations. On the other hand, we also have ultrasound imaging that can allow us to image deeper with higher penetration depth uh, uh, with a lower spatial resolution. And this can be tweaked depending on the detector bandwidth. In terms of ultrasound, it can be used to image tissue morphology. Or if you're looking at Doppler effect, we can also look at blood flow as well. However, there's still some challenges in terms of differentiating among different kinds of tissue uh, in terms of tumor, uh, information of fat on the ultrasound image, which are shot as a kind of a region that looks similar with low intensity. Okay, so in the context of uh, the above uh, mentioned uh, challenges, we started to look for a method uh, that can allow us to do surgical mapping of skin lesions that can address all of these uh, issues at the same time. So in our search, we found optoacoustic to be very promising. Uh, so it has like a high penetration depth with a very good spatial resolution. And this depth to resolution ratio can be optimized for different applications depending on the detector bandwidth uh, and, and the geometry uh, of the entire system as well. Um, can be used to do 3D uh, tomography imaging. It can be used to provide uh, different kinds of contrast. We are talking about things like anatomical imaging, looking at structure, or functional imaging, where we look at perfusion and oxygenation, uh, or even molecular imaging, which is based on either endogenous or uh, exogenous contrast. In addition, it can be real time, uh, it's completely non invasive. Uh, and in the context of clinical applications, we are more focused towards endogenous contrast, uh, even though extrinsic contrast, such as um, indocyanide green, which is FDA approved, can be used as well. So, essentially, what does all this mean for the dermatologist? So, with a uh, good penetration depth, uh, with the offering of multiple kinds of contrast, the clinician can now non invasively achieve a more precise delineation of the surgical margins in the case of a cancerous lesion. And that in turn means that uh, with proper mapping, less healthy tissue is removed and the surgical times can be shortened. Here's a quick overview of the different kinds of uh, skin cancer. Right, so on the top left, we have uh, different kinds of cells in the epidermis with squamous, spacer, melanocytes. Uh, and all of these different cells uh, can uh, potentially undergo some kind of mutation in, in their growth uh, due to exposure of the skin to UV light leading to DNA damage. Uh, in this study, we are focusing on more towards uh, basal cell carcinoma uh, and also a bit of viral warts as well. And whatever techniques we will be showing in this study can also be extended to other kinds of skin lesions such as melanoma as well, or even SEC. Okay, so in terms of skin lesion uh, management in the clinic, uh, in terms of biopsy, uh, typically a something called a punch biopsy is done on patients with suspicious skin lesions. Essentially, it's some kind of a blade that's circular that goes down a few millimeters into tissue. Um, so the tissue is then uh, removed and placed under the microscope to check for cancerous cells. And if uh, the skin lesion is diagnosed as cancerous after this, it'll be marked for excision. Uh, in the middle of this slide, we have something called white excision, essentially making a kind of a larger cut uh, around the lesion uh, with uh, some kind of a margin to ensure that all of the cells are removed. Uh, so this kind of uh, remove uh, some level of healthy tissue, which is not desirable in uh, certain parts of the body. And that's why we have the, um, the surgery on the right as well. Most surgery uh, is more conservative, uh, more suitable for aesthetically sensitive regions like the face. So essentially the lesion is removed in multiple steps, um, layers and layers one by one removed and checked under the microscope. And this whole process is repeated until the microscope shows no more cancerous cells. 
So this process, uh, mostly, uh, is good in terms of removing less healthy tissue. However, uh, it's kind of like a long, tedious uh, process that can take up to six to eight hours. In this context, uh, we believe and we have shown that MSOT is able to offer uh, accurate 3D mapping of lesion uh, margins and vasculature. And that essentially means uh, less healthy tissue removed and shorter surgical times. Okay, so uh, this is the system configuration uh, that we have used uh, and some details on the study protocol. Um, system, we use the MSOL Envision 512 uh, with 512 transducer elements, uh, and we couple it uh, with uh, handheld probes. In terms of laser wavelength, we are using a near infrared region that has a low tissue absorption and thus allowing high penetration depth. Um, wavelength range between 700 to 900 uh, nanometers. We chose uh, 10 wavelength within this range very carefully to ensure that we can do proper spectra mixing of tissue chromophores. And uh, that includes oxyhemoglobin, deoxyhemoglobin, and melanin. So for example, we chose things like uh, wavelengths like 700 where melan melanin absorbs like strongly and we choose other wavelengths like maybe 900 where oxyhemoglobin uh, absorbs strongly. And also we chose uh, something called the isobastic point at 800 nanometers where oxy and deoxyhemoglobin absorb like to a similar extent. Uh, in terms of handheld probes, uh, we use uh, two kinds of probes. First one will be a 3D probe, a uh, hemispherical array of uh, elements, transducer elements, uh, isotropic in terms of resolution, uh, of uh, around 80 microns. Uh, the field of views is around like 10 by 10 by 12, where 12 is the depth. Uh, as uh, another probe that we use is 2D uh, probe as well. Uh, that allows us to acquire cross-sectional 2D images in um, XZ and YZ planes. Uh, in plane resolution around 200 microns, uh, field of view 25 by 25 millimeters. In this study, uh, we image around uh, 26 patients, uh, data acquisition time, five minutes for each patient. Uh, some logic sticks here. We apply ultrasound gel between the skin and the probe. Uh, and of course, we did some uh, post-processing after data acquisition, uh, for example, using back projection algorithms for image reconstruction. So uh, here is uh, some results uh, some of the results that we got using the handheld 3D probe. So uh, so let me try to navigate from the top left uh, towards the right. So we have first, we have a clinical image of the basal cell carcinoma lesion. Uh, you can see that it has a heterogeneous uh, kind of a pigment uh, distribution. Uh, the H and E staining uh, below that uh, shows nodules of base, basal cells. And uh, at the same time, we also did a convocal microscopy imaging on the bottom left uh, that shows kind of a tumor cells and dermis. Uh, the bright spots uh, corresponds to melanin. In the middle of this slide, uh, we have some, we have uh, different projections, which we call maximum intensity projections, or uh, we call it MIPS, uh, of the M sort images along different uh, directions, X, Y, Y, Z, and X, Z. Uh, as well as the 3D uh, projection of the entire lesion. So uh, in these images, the yellow color represents a melanin in the lesion. Uh, we have uh, red signals as well that corresponds to oxyhemoglobin uh, blood vessels uh, surrounding the, the region. And, um, and from these images, uh, we actually uh, drew uh, white lines, as you can see in the figures. Uh, that allows us to kind of uh, compute the tumor length and the depth. So these white lines are actually drawn along the longest and the deepest axis. And after drawing uh, these white lines, white dotted lines, then on the right, we're able to plot the melanin uh, oxyhemoglobin uh, MSOT signal along these lines. Uh, as you can see, uh, we kind of have a baseline value uh, which is uh, based on the signals in the background, um, the signals above the skin surface in the image. 
and uh, basically we measure the the range, the distance where the signal, the melanin or the oxyhemoglobin signals is above the baseline values, and that allows us to compute the tumor um, depth and the length uh, as well. Okay, so uh, this is a sample image of uh, 2D image, right? So from the 2D probe, uh, as you can see on the right, we have uh, good melanin signals from uh, pigmentation of skin surface. Uh, we can see the lesion uh, very clearly as well. Uh, below it, we, we get um, blood signals as shown by the red and the blue and, and overlapping of the two uh, where the purple region is fall, right? So, uh, so the images show that we can we can uh, image and uh, visualize very well defined lesion boundaries. Um, and for all the images that we did, we compared our MSOT measurements of the tumor length and depth with histological measurements, uh, as shown in the table in this slide. Um, as you can see, the values are, are pretty close. Uh, we are getting very high uh, Pearson correlation coefficient values. Okay, so uh, this slide uh, is a, it's an image of viral wart. Uh, again, we do MIPS, um, very MSOT images and from different in different projections. Uh, okay, let me try to play the video. Um, yeah, so uh, 3D rendering, we get signals, mel again, melanin signals from the surface. Uh, we can see a very clear artery uh, below below the viral wart uh, showing like a, Kind of like providing blood uh, nutrients uh, and also we see like a spot a scattered like red signals in between the artery and the, and the lesion right so showing the, uh, there's some kind of capillary signals from there as well okay so in terms of statistical analysis um, so we did uh, several um, kind of plots uh, so let me try to run through this slide from left to right. So on the left, we have um, compared the MSOT and histological measurements uh, for both tumor depth on top and tumor length below. Um, as you can see, we're getting a very nice uh, goodness of fit. Uh, we are having high correlation coefficients up to 0.9. Um, in the, middle, in the middle of this slide, we also did a blend a almond plot where the difference in MSOT and histological measurements is plotted against the average of the two. Um, so we can see that uh, from these two plots, uh, there are very small differences in terms of uh, for both a tumor depth and tumor length between MSOT and histology uh, within 95% uh, limit for agreement. On the right, we also want to find out whether the type of surgery uh, can affect, whether it would affect our measurements, uh, MSOP measurements, and, uh, and how it compare against histology. So again, we plot uh, the difference in measurements for tumor depth and length between MSOP histology for different kinds of surgery to uh, addition versus more surgery. Uh, and we did uh, unpaired uh, t-test, right? So uh, after doing t-test, uh, we are getting uh, p-values that show that there's no significant bias or differences in measurements uh, between histology and MSOT, uh, no matter what surgery we are looking at. Okay, let me quick, uh, quickly uh, sum up uh, the presentation of this study. Uh, essentially, we did uh, the first immense use of MSOT for 3D mapping and visualizing of non-melanoma skin lesion, uh, as well as the surrounding vasculature as well. Uh, we validated our MSOT measurements of the dimensions for both depth and length with histology. Uh, we make use of different kinds of contrast, uh, melanin as well as hemoglobin as well. Uh, MSOT is good, it's, it's real time imaging, uh, not completely non invasive, uh, and it's labor free for this uh, particular study. So, essentially, uh, we have shown a uh, proof of concept that MSOT is able to help us map out the surgical lesion. 
uh, that allows the uh, dermatologist uh, to acquire to achieve more precise lesion addition. Uh, and in the most surgery context, uh, it basically means a, a less number of steps, uh, shorter surgical times. So with that, I'll end my uh, part of the presentation. And now I'll hand over to Danish, who will continue the second half. Thank you very much, Chris. I'll just transfer over to uh, Danish. And while I'm doing that, please feel free to type in your questions. Danish, you now have control. The slides very much clear. I'm audible. You are indeed. Thank you, team, for the fantastic introduction about SBIC and also about our overall research direction. Thank you, Chris. Hello to all of you and warm greetings from Singapore. As Chris has just highlighted about the application of MSORT for skin cancer, let me take you through our recent study using optoacoustic technique, specifically raster scanning optoacoustic mesoscopy or RSOM for skin inflammatory conditions. Some of you may be very familiar with the instrument and technical specs of RSOM, but please allow me in the interest of wider audience to take few minutes to explain it briefly. RSOM is a novel optoacoustic imaging technique that offers non-invasive, label-free, high-resolution skin image. We can achieve about 10 micron axial resolution and about 35 to 40 micron lateral resolution, and it is extremely suited for skin imaging. It can achieve a penetration that about two millimeter while largely preserving high resolution capabilities. It uses a single wavelength, that means at 532 nanometer pulse laser, and we are using a transducer at a central frequency of 50 megahertz. And just to let you know, to image an area of about five by three millimeter, it will take about 2.5 minutes. This RSOM system is fitted with a flexible imaging probe and the spherical focused transducer is scanned through with the illumination fiber bundle over the region of interest as you can see here. The resultant optoacoustic waves due to the pulse laser illumination and absorption of light by endogenous absorbers like melanin and blood in the skin and are collected. Data is then tomographically reconstructed to yield an image that represents the three-dimensional distribution of absorbed light within the skin. Now, if you look at this video, I hope it's playing well, you can see high, high resolution structural image of the skin depicting detailed vascular structures in the dermis. Now, what is eczema or atopic dermatitis? Because that's a disease we are targeting here. Eczema is a chronic inflammatory skin disease with a huge patient burden. Accurate assessment of disease severity is extremely important to monitor the longitudinal response to therapeutic interventions and also in guiding subsequent management. It is characterized by intense itching sensation, scratching, and eczematous lesions with dry, scaling and crusted areas of skin and it leads to lichenification and pigmentary changes. Frequent flare-up at varying frequency and period of remission is a common feature. It often flares up when you are stressed or under pressure because the stress hormones can lead to increased inflammatory markers. Interestingly, among kids, specifically school-going children, it can often flare up during examination time. It sounds a bit interesting. It typically occurs in individuals with personal or family history of asthma or allergic rhinoconjunctivitis.
if you look at the prevalence in the 2015 statistics, eczema is accounting about 245 million people all over the world. Lifetime prevalence in the range from 15 to 30 percent in children, while it is about 2 to 10 percent in adults. In Singapore, about one in five children have eczema, while one in nine adults, which is quite a huge number. Eczema causes huge burden to health sector and hence the market is expected to register a growth rate of about 7.8% over the forecast period of 2018-2023. Chronic inflammatory skin disease area, sorry, chronic skin inflammatory skin disease related to systematic complications such as atherosclerosis, type 2 diabetes or metabolic syndrome due to systemic inflammation. Individuals with eczema tend to have a self-reported history of hypertension and adult onset diabetes, even with controlled BMI and other comorbidities. In infants, it can occur in face and skull. In childhood, and severity might occur in extensor wrist and ankles, while in adolescence and adulthood, it can be dominant in necks and eyelids. Though the distribution is not limited to some particular regions, it has some trend as a function of age and the severity vary accordingly. Now let me move to the common scoring system that is used to evaluate the severity of eczema. And I mean that the first one is SCORAD. It stands for scoring of atopic dermatitis. It has mainly three parts. It is calculated using this equation, which is given here. The part A constitute the area, part B constitute the intensity, and part C constitute the subjective symptoms. Area, which is area involved, is about contributing 20% to the total score, while intensity is contributed by mainly six features, such as erythema, swelling scratching, oozing, lichenification, and dryness. This accounts for about 60% of the score. Each item has a grade 0, 1, 2, 3, depending upon healthy, mild, moderate, and severe. Last component, that is C, is subjective symptom, that is itchiness and sleeplessness of a patient, which is graded on a scale 0 to 10, and it's constitute 20% of the total score. Generally, mild eczema has a score less than 25, moderate 25 to 30, 50, and severe eczema have a score more than 50. Second scoring system called EC stands for Eczema Area and Severity Index. It's involved mainly in four body regions, head and neck, upper extremities, trunk, and lower extremities. It's based on four key Signs or features again, erythema, that is redness, thickness, scratching, and lichenification, and it has, each has a score between zero to three. As I mentioned earlier, like this is for healthy, mild, moderate, and severe respectively. EC score can range from zero to 72. That means for a healthy, it's zero, mild up to 5.9, moderate between six to 22.9, while severe it is between 23 to 72. So what are the drawbacks of the scoring system? It is obvious that these scoring systems are purely subjective. I mean, it is based on certain clinical observations and questionnaires and are subjected to intra-observer and inter-observer variations. Clinicians often say that the score will vary if if they do the scoring for a particular patient at two different times of a day, it shows that how subjective is the scoring, right? Moreover, this scoring system can't reveal any subclinical or structural changes below the skin surface. Since the scores are susceptible to inter and intra-person variation, as I mentioned, it cannot be used as a comprehensive tool to monitor treatment response and also to evaluate the associated comorbidities.
So let me own my laser pointer. Yeah. So in this context, we wanted to address the unmet clinical need to develop a unique objective scoring system for eczema using RSOM imaging. The RSOM image of three patients with varying severities here. As you can see here, this shows for the healthy subject, moderate eczema and severe eczema. Our study cohort, study cohort consisted of 91 subjects out of the 24 are females and majority, that means about 96 of them are in a Fitzpatrick score three to four, mainly due to the Asian population. In this image, the low frequency bands, that is, as I marked here, 11 to 33 megahertz in the red color, represent the bigger vascular structures, while the high frequency bands, that is 33 to 99 megahertz in green, represent the smaller vascular structures. As you can see here clearly, the uppermost layer, this epidermis, and this forms a dermis layer. The cutaneous blood vascular architecture consists of lower and upper horizontal plexus. The capillary loops that can be seen in the form of a dot like structure in a severe eczema case here. It's obvious that from the image, epidermal thickness is higher with higher degree of eczema. And more vascular structures in red can also be seen in indicating increased inflammation. We deduced four metrics, epidermal thickness, total blood volume, TBV, vascular diameter in the dermis, and ratio of low and high frequency components. TBV represents, in order to calculate TBV, we set the voxels to be one when its value is above a threshold, and the rest voxels to be zero. That means TBV was taken as a count of the total number of voxels with a value of one in a segmented dermis region. To evaluate the vessel diameter, the selection of blood vessel should be parallel to the skin surface as much as possible and at the similar or at same depth. Ratio of low and high frequency term LHFR is metric basically represent the ratio between big and small microvascular structures in the dermis. So, this shows the representative RSOM image of healthy subject, patient and non lesional region, mild eczema, moderate eczema, and severe eczema. Big vascular structures in red appeared more prominent in eczema patients. Increasing trends was also shown for epidermal thickness, check total blood volume, LHFR from healthy controls to eczema patients. If you can see here, for the healthy subject, the epidermal thickness, it is about 150 micron while it is increased up to close to 400 microns in a severe eczema. While total blood volume is three times increased for severe eczema compared to the healthy subject. Similarly, for the LHFR, you can see about a 50% increase in the eczema case compared to the healthy subjects. Notably, there is an increase in vessel diameter in eczema subjects, you can see here, which is about 35 to 40 micron compared to non lesional areas where the subjects which are having a diameter about 25 microns. But there is no significant difference we observed between mild, moderate and severe eczema. We can also see enlarged capillary loops reflecting higher skin inflammation in the image. Now, next we formulated the unique novel eczema vascular and structural index called EVSI. We could successfully classify between healthy and eczematous skin and also distinguish the severity of eczema using EVSI. We used a linear kernel support vector machine classifier, SVM classifier model for classification of healthy and eczema skin. 
we could achieve an accuracy of about 87%, sensitivity of about 85%, and a specificity of, of about 84%. EVSI deduced mainly from the three components that shows the major significant change, that is epidermis thickness, TBV, and LHFR. PSN correlation test was performed between the EVSI and the eczema scoroid, and we can achieve a significant clinical relevance. This shows that from eczema, vascular, and structural index EVSI, we can achieve a quantitative objective scoring and classification of eczema. We also use ORSOM to monitor the treatment response in a biologics patient. Biologic was tried in a 67-year-old male, and he was diagnosed with eczema since the age of six, and had a previously used tropical corticosteroid therapy and phototherapy with minimal response. Dupilamab is the first biologics we tried in Singapore for the adults with uncontrolled, moderate to severe atopic dermatitis. It targets the signaling of IL-4 and IL-3 cytokinins involved in the underlying inflammatory process in atopic dermatitis. We imaged the patient before the biologics and four weeks after the treatment to visualize skin morphology and subsequent vascular changes. From the image, if you look at this image, the image on the left, that means marked A, is before treatment and the image marked B, this is after treatment. It is obvious that the irregular and thickened epidermis seen before the treatment is changed to a more regular epidermis with less thickening. Post-treatment, we could also observe a reduction in enlarged capillary loops, as you can see, compare this and this image, decrease in total blood volume and vessel diameter, or due to the reduction in inflammation. Quantitatively, we observed a reduction of about 32% in epidermis thickness, 10% in TBV, and 26% in vessel diameter due to biologics treatment. These results were validated using TWL measurement and serum markers. This shows that optoacoustic imaging can detect subclinical skin changes that may not be apparent clinically and allows repeated measurements over time. Hence, potentially, it will serve as a treatment monitoring targets in addition to serum biomarkers. This will also potentially reveal certain skin prognostic features of different biological therapies targeting various signal, signaling pathways in other inflammatory conditions as well. So let me summarize this. For the first time, we developed an optoacoustic based structural imaging approach to differentiate the severity of eczema. We developed a quantitative objective imaging matrix called EVSI. For the first time, using this EVSI, we could differentiate severity of eczema. We also used ARSOM imaging to image the biologics patient, and we can quantitatively track the progress of treatment response. Some problem with uh, screen. Yeah. So let me summarize here. These are the key publications. As Chris highlighted some of these things, you for the skin cancer and some hair follicle studies. We are also working, and some of the publication eczema using ARSOM is listed here, and some publications are under review as well.
Finally, we would like to thank the entire laboratory of bioptical imaging team members led by Prof. Professor Malini Olivo, and our team is a multidisciplinary team with diverse expertise. We are also working on other skin diseases and application with industry partners in the cosmeceutical and skin therapy monitoring domain. We are open for new partnership and collaboration. We are also using optoacoustic imaging for other translational clinical application that includes breast cancer image. Finally, let me take this opportunity to thank our collaborators. As mentioned before, we set up the first joint lab with Aitara Medical. Sincere thanks goes to our clinical collaborators, Professor Dr. Stephen Thun, who oversee all clinical aspects of the studies. And for inflammatory skin studies, we worked very closely with Dr. Equing. And for the skin cancer, we worked with Dr. Sai. We would also like to wish and thank Prof. Vasilis Juan and Daniel Rosensky, Prof. Daniel Rosensky for the collaboration and support. We are open for collaboration and you may contact us in your first for further discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much to both of you. That was a great talk on the two different techniques and the two different disease types that you're studying. So as mentioned, if you do have questions, please feel free to send them in. Uh, we will have about 15 minutes left for questions and I've probably got about uh, 15 minutes worth of questions to go to. So what I'll do is I'll try and direct them either to you both or to one particular area in particular. But uh, one of the questions that has come in, and this is quite relevant to optoacoustic imaging, is you mentioned the patients had a Fitzpatrick score of three to four. Are the limitations on uh, imaging with optoacoustics on the skin pigmentation? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, uh, we actually we started this study initially by imaging uh, a subject with FP score two to five. Okay, so we could image it successfully and nicely. And as you can see, and um, as I mentioned, all the subject, 91 subject, we image for eczema in a Fitzpatrick score three to four. As the images are quite nice and and it is quite useful, and and we did not face much problem with that one. Okay, uh, but uh, higher than uh, three to four is probably going to be more difficult, isn't it? We did five as well. In uh, that's in our one of the paper in general of biophotonics, we compared it. So of course there is a uh, higher melanin absorption may cause issues. Okay, that uh, the vascularity may not be so obvious in the, like in the case of uh, uh, Fitzpatrick score up to three and four. In that case, we may have to have some. Uh, uh, correcting algorithms to look into that one and also to offset for this higher melanin absorption. Okay. Uh, regarding other absorbers is, uh, can you image lipid or other absorbers within the skin? So this is referring to R-SOM. Okay, so for the R-SOM, we use a single wavelength. And now we are moving, now means in a, in a couple of weeks time, we are moving to the multi-wavelength, multi-spectral R-SOM, that's called multi-spectral R-SOM. Where it has a four wavelength, mainly 532, 555, 579, and 606. That's mainly for vasculature and blood. I don't think it can be used to image lipids. Okay? But if you want to image lipids, as Chris mentioned, uh, we can use MSORT, where it's wavelength covering up to 1300. And we did some study as well using MSORT. Uh, yeah, so uh, Chris here, maybe I'll add on to that. Uh... Yeah, so that's a good question. I mean, if you want to look beyond melanin and hemoglobin, if you're looking into things like water and lipids, uh, so we, we can actually go beyond 900 nanometers uh, near 1,000. Uh, just to give an example, if we're looking at lipid signals, we can look at uh, a, the lipid peak uh, at 12, 10 nanometers. Uh, and we have done that successfully uh, in our hair follicle studies where we look at lipids in the sebaceous glands around the hair follicle. Cool. So a question actually, I'll ask this to Chris because I think this is most relevant um, and it does stem from kind of the, the historic use of MSOT is although we can look at kind of the therapeutic effect of a biological agent or a, or a drug, is is it possible to use MSOT to look at drug delivery via transdermal drug delivery or nanoparticle drug delivery and so on? Uh, 
in terms of like a kind of maybe penetration profiling? I would say uh, penetration profile and probably I'd probably focus this on mice rather than people, I guess. Uh, yeah, we can certainly do that. Uh, so if you're talking about drugs, uh, so it really depends on what kind of drugs you're looking at. Uh, but if let's say drug has a kind of a component attached to it that has that can exhibit some uh, photoacoustic signals, right? So in terms of photoacoustic uh, so-called probes and um, so we, we have different classes, so it can be nanoparticles, it can be carbon nanotubes, it can be fluorescent dyes and things like that. So, um, so to answer that question, as long as that, uh, there's some part of the drug that, that, uh, that can uh, absorb light very strongly in tissue, uh, we can actually track that drug as it goes through uh, the tissue, go through uh, the body, right? So uh, of course, uh, with, with the right penetration depth as well. Uh, with the right system configuration yeah okay and this i think is a nice question for both techniques is very very nice work thank you uh, it's nice to see the assessment of therapy is it likely that msot or rsom can be used as a predictive tool pre-therapy are there structural patterns or differences in the skin diseases you looked at or may be noticeable as predictors so uh, if i can address to it it's a very nice question. Actually, that's some of the things we are currently studying. That's why we are planning a huge clinical study in Singapore, a large study. Of course, it is interrupted by this COVID. So what we want to do is exactly the same thing. Okay. So by, by using our SOM, we want to develop some predictive model that can indicate skin inflammatory condition and even some comorbidities as well. Yeah, exactly. That is something we are working on it. Yeah, okay. maybe I'll add on a bit to that as well. Uh, yeah, so uh, we're definitely moving in the direction, right? Prediction, precision medicine, and things like that. Uh, I mean, as far as this does, uh, this uh, RSO study is concerned, as you can see, we, we derive some uh, vascular matrix to do some kind of classification, which kind of sets the foundation towards the prediction. Uh, so we are getting very good uh, sensitivity values and things like that. So moving forward, uh, we can actually use whatever we have developed in terms of vascular matrix and the indexes that we have uh, to look at uh, all these uh, skin diseases and uh, use that as a predictor. Uh, so we are moving in that direction. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what do you think about using MSOT for early diagnosis of NMSC? So I assume that's non-melanoma skin cancer? Uh, I think that's what we basically uh, non melanoma, right? Yeah, I, I assume so, yes. Uh, yeah, that's what we cover in this study, I guess. Uh, basal cell and um, uh, yeah, even though it's pigmented in the Asian population. Um, right, so I hope I answered the question correctly. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. We have. Okay, so I think this is for Dinesh. Did you compare your method with established methods, e.g. the uh, the mexometer, uh, chronometer, high frequency ultrasound, uh, SC thickness or OCT? Okay, very nice question. So uh, for the Maxima study, we did a parallel study using a uh, handheld confocal Raman system, which is a completely patented by our own team. We compared with that one and we developed uh, uh, some biochemical features coming out of Raman technology to validate it. Okay, So actually that is published in, uh, in, in one of the paper. So to, to say that for the biologics patient, we validated using serum markers like uh, eosinophil count, IgE count, like that. Okay, And we are also looking at for our upcoming large study, we will be doing some uh, biopsy as well to, for that kind of validation as well. Okay, and in the eczema study, what were the exact definitions for mild, moderate, and severe eczema? Oh, that's that's uh, again based on our clinicians' uh, uh, scoring. As I mentioned, we we, we based on the scorex system. As anything below twenty five, we taken as mild. Twenty five to fifty as moderate, and above fifty as uh, uh, severe. That's that's a benchmark we used. Okay. That's I think globally. Everybody is following that 
Okay, I see. Uh, a couple of technical questions. I could probably answer these. Is what is the pulse wave, uh, pulse width on the um, MSOT and the RSOM system? I'll probably say that's typically between about six to ten uh, nanoseconds. Yeah. And then an interesting question, actually, which is uh, with the RSOM, why are you using uh, two frequency bands? Oh, so then in, to specifically to, to, to delineate the bigger and smaller vascular structure, right? So in eczema, when uh, due to this inflammation, the vascular structures can be inflamed. That means, uh, uh, what do you call it? Expanded, okay? So if you want to differentiate that with the microvascular structures, you want to have a two frequency band. So basically, when we look at the higher frequency band, it, look, it is mainly delineating the smaller structures and the, the lower frequency band will will help to look at the bigger vascular structures. So I think by splitting this frequency band, that's why we could look at the, uh, the change in the uh, vessel diameter as well, okay, by the enlargement of the vessel diameter as well. So, so to make my answer very short, to look at the large and small vessels simultaneously and also to overlay it, we split it in the two frequency bands. Okay, so if effectively the small vessels have a higher frequency response and yep. larger vessels yep. have a, a lower frequency exactly. response. And yep. when you see inflammation and swelling, you move to the uh, to the lower frequency response, I guess. Yep. Uh, interesting question. Obviously, I think this has been uh, shown uh, previously by other groups, but I'll ask it anyway for, for Chris. Is can you image uh, metastatic or in-transit melanoma? Uh, I, we haven't done that ourselves, uh, but definitely we can look at that. I mean, as since there's melanin content, I assume, right? Yes. So, yeah. So I'm not familiar, but, but I would I would say that definitely yes. Uh, so uh, I think coming back to a question that was asked earlier, I think uh, probably there's some slight confusion. I mean, uh, we are getting melanin signal in uh, this study, even though it's not melanoma skin cancer, just because uh, we have. Uh, basically, we have pigments, uh, pigmented lesions uh, for BCC in the Asian population. Just want to clarify that. Yeah. Just to add on one point, it's not so easy to get uh, uh, melanoma cases in Singapore. Oh, uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I'll point people to uh, a, um, a publication from uh, In Science Translation Medicine, I think it was 2015 by Joachim Klode, who looked at uh, melanoma in uh, sentinel lymph nodes using MSOT. Yeah which I think is uh, the most descriptive work to date yes. on that. Uh, and a final question, uh, interesting one is, can I image the nail bed, i.e. for vascular imaging? So I feel someone is looking at uh, inflammation as well, uh, maybe in systemic sclerosis or, or similar. I think nail bed was imaged successfully by Vasilis and Juan. I think they already published, I guess, in, if I remember correctly, somewhere in 2018. I think, so, yeah. I think so, yeah. So yes, you can use the nail bed. Yeah. Uh, yes. And I'll probably, uh, if there's no more questions coming in, I think they've all uh, stopped now. That was a great session. Uh, some great questions there. Uh, as mentioned, uh, I'd obviously like to thank uh, Chris and Dinesh for such a great talk and, and taking the time to present their work. And I'd also say that, again, they're very keen on collaboration and talking to people. So feel free to reach out to them or to us if you want any further information. Uh, I'll mention that uh, we have another webinar on the 16th of July, which we will be uh, discussing uh, lymphedema. And uh, I'll thank you all for your time today and uh, for attending this. You'll receive the YouTube link in the next couple of days and uh, have a lovely rest of your day and a lovely weekend as we move to uh, Friday. And again, thank you, Chris. Thank you, Dinesh. And uh, I hope to see you soon in person. Yeah, thank, thank you, you team. team. Thank uh, you all. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you everyone who's uh, tuning in. Yeah. Thank you. Take bye. Care.